Ever since I first heard about this Ryzen 5 1600 AF, I've been curious to see exactly what it can do. Just the amount of attention it got at the time from all corners of the media was impressive and I thought to myself, hang on, this is just a rebranded Zen Plus product, what is so amazing about it? It doesn't have PBO and it doesn't seem to have anything improved over the 2600 so why is everyone telling me that this is the best thing since sliced bread? And today I'm guessing we're going to figure it out together. Funny enough, at most shops where this is being sold, it actually costs more than the 2600 which frankly makes no sense but thankfully it can be found at a decent enough price on the used market so that is what I did. I know I've gone a little bit overkill on some of the components in this build but frankly I thought that this would be a great opportunity to have a computer that is good in the here and now and also have a very good upgrade path far into the future and by far into the future I mean for the next three to four years which admittedly is a very long time in computer terms. For the motherboard I've gone with the unfortunately long name MSI X470 Gaming Plus Max. The theoretically supports process all the way to the new release 5950X and it's basically the last thing you need in terms of an AM4 board as we already know that the next platform is going to support DDR5 and it's not going to be backwards compatible with the current generation process. Next the RAM is taken care of by 2GB sticks of HyperX DDR4 3200 MHz or more aptly mega transfer per second RAM that I've tested previously and they can run stable at 3466 with CL18. The SSD is an Intel 240GB that is running in a SATA configuration in the secondary M.2 slot. And of course the graphics card is a blower style GTX 970. If you'd like to see more about that GTX 970, I've torn it down and replaced the paste and also did a benchmark run on my 5950 which would certainly remove all bottlenecks with the only limiting factor being the card itself. And spoiler alert, there was no discernible difference between the 5950 and the 1600 AF in gaming with this card. The case is a rather good looking old Amtec one, well good looking in my eyes at least, but the nice thing about it is it has plenty of airflow. Unfortunately the only downside is that it doesn't really have any modern cable management systems so you're kind of left with a well, bunch of cables hanging loosely everywhere which I try to tie up on the only two tie up points that exist on the entire case. No clever behind the motherboard cable management systems or those fancy new trays that you can pull in and out but that's okay because the one thing I can do properly is support lots and lots of fans. First up is Heaven and this older benchmark did predictably very well with the graphics card being maxed out and the processor only reaching about 15% utilization at its peak, boasting a very respectable 90 FPS on average, backed up by some remarkably consistent frame times. Yuninjin Superposition also had a strong showing with 40 FPS on average and again very consistent frame times. This is a much newer benchmark but it's still a very fluid experience at 1080p high. With respect to Rocket League, I discovered that in previous testing I made a mistake by not engaging any bots in gameplay, that being a major contributor to why this graphics card could keep the frame rate locked at 242 FPS, but even so with bots and everything turned all the way up you still get over 160 FPS. In Fortnite with epic settings it hovers mostly around 60 FPS but most gamers will not play that way. Turning the settings down to medium and setting the draw distance to epic will yield an excess of 144 frames a second which means that you can safely use a 144Hz monitor with this game and play competitively. Death Stranding at very high settings stays mostly at 60 FPS but oscillates between 45 and 60 when the action heats up. The nice thing about this game is that you are out in an open world and most of the time you really want the eye candy because you are admiring your environment as opposed to trying to fight the baddies or get away from the beach thing. So I personally find this a really good experience.
Horizon Zero Dawn, another game built on the Decima engine such as Death Stranding, performs a bit worse than Death Stranding, but then again, there is a lot more going on on screen at any given time, and also this is a benchmark so it will push it far beyond what you find in normal gameplay. But even so, 48 FPS at favor quality is really good, and if you really must have that 60 FPS experience, you can always go down to the original quality, which is the same as the consoles. The experience is comparable to an RX 570, maybe with a few FPS here and there, but none of the annoying bugs that the AMD drivers were experiencing are present here. All the textures loading smoothly, everything is fine. I'd notice none of the jitteriness and the, the low resolution environment seemingly popping out of nowhere. Assassin's Creed Valhalla with everything turned up to high except textures were set on medium to stay within the frame buffer averages 39 fps which is perfectly playable but if you want a few more frames dialing down the settings to medium will give you that without sacrificing much in the way of visual fidelity. Cyberpunk 2077 with a mixture of low and medium settings at 1080p only averages about 37 FPS while driving around the city, but to be fair this is an absolute worst case scenario and the FPS is closer to 50 when indoors. Furthermore, because the frame times are so consistent you get a much better experience than the raw numbers would suggest. Of course there is scope to still turn down the settings or the resolution or use one of those community created patches that optimizes and dials down hidden settings, but if you're playing on a big screen like me that kind of makes the game look very soft and fuzzy and it, it takes away that nice shine the game has. But if you absolutely must have more FPS I think the best way to achieve that is to leave the resolution at 1080p and play around with the settings until you hit your desired threshold. Best I could get it was about 55 FPS on average. The really good news is the processor tops up below 60% utilization so are very, we are very far away from being bottlenecked, allowing this GPU to provide everything it can at all times. Now coming to our final benchmark, the ever popular GTA 5, which is an era appropriate benchmark for this graphics card, a game which has been very well supported by developers and had countless patches over the years, still looks stunning in 2021. Fiddling a little bit with the settings is very easy to get a 60 FPS locked frame rate, or if you are so inclined, even over 100. I am benchmarking here with absolutely torturous settings, so this is not 100% indicative of real gameplay. It just makes it so much easier to accurately compare between GPUs when they are under the maximum amount of stress possible. Again, not having any sort of trouble from the processor. And now I guess it's time to talk value. Is this good value? From a purely gaming perspective, I would say yes, this is a computer that you can live with for the foreseeable future until the graphics card prices come back down to something approaching normal. And now lastly, what about the performance for everything else apart from games? I edited and rendered this video on the system and honestly it worked very well. I didn't have any problems scrubbing through a timeline or anything like that and the rendering time for a 10 minute clip was not egregious. If I had to give an Intel equivalent to this 1600 AF processor off the top of my head, I would say that the 5960X Core i7 Extreme Edition is the closest equivalent, that being an HEDT processor with quad channel memory. And it's in a bench 11.5 this core 12.46 in normal mode and because this doesn't feature ppo i thought to try and turn on the game boost from msi in the bios which admittedly did improve the score to about 1329 but at a really high cost in my opinion what it did it overclocked the processor by about 200 megahertz and kept it locked at that frequency no matter what so there was no intelligent speed shifting or anything like that it just kept it there forever and ever and never moved which i doubt it will do wonders to the longevity of this processor if it's been kept like that 24-7. But then again I guess it's nice to have the option of automatic overclocking no matter how dumb its own implementation is. I am certain even a novice with a little bit of time on his hands and Ryzen Master can create a profile that will rival that and even beat it with far better thermals and energy efficiency. And obviously without compromising the lifespan of the processor. And I'm going to be signing off here. I'm going to leave you with the scores in R23 and R20. So I hope you enjoyed and see you in the next one.